Welcome to Smash Fiction, the podcast where we pit two or more fictional characters against one another in a battle of models, matte paintings, or shaking the camera to make it look like the ground is moving. This week, Stormtroopers versus Red Shirts. Astro Antebellum. <laughs> Day 381. It's been almost a year since the Cosmo Rumpus came to an end because of something about the board game Clue and a bunch of random characters having to write doctoral dissertations. It made sense. <laughs> Let's just say accounts vary. <laughs> but the process of rebuilding war-torn multiversal space has been a slow one. For the race known as Thermians, the fighting was especially taxing. The flagship of their armada, the Protector, was nearly destroyed after being caught in the crossfire of a conflict between Urquan Dreadnoughts, the Urkin Massive, and those stupid ships from Galaga, the ones that grab you in tractor beams and drag you away. Ah, oh, they're the worst. <laughs> Thankfully, due to the quick thinking and tactical brilliance of Captain Jen Ben, the Protector emerged victorious, but suffered massive casualties and found itself understaffed for the journey back to the Klaatu Nebula. Fortune smiled upon the remaining crew of the Protector, however. Near the site of the battle was the strange saucer ship known as the USS Enterprise. Acting captain of the Enterprise, Montgomery Scott, expressed admiration at the Protector's prowess in battle. Scott explained that he had been put in command of the Enterprise after the ship's two senior officers had mysteriously visited vanished, mm -hmm. but they'd recently received wedding photos from the two, so everyone was relieved to hear that things had turned out all right. <laughs> <laughs> Still, that meant that the Enterprise had no plans to involve itself in any combat in the near future, so Scott offered to beam 55 of Starfleet Command's finest red-shirted crewmen to assist the Protector in getting back to Thermian space. Sadly, a transporter malfunction resulted in five of the red shirts being accidentally atomized, but thankfully the <laughs> remaining red shirts were more than enough to fill the required roles on the protector, and the course was set for Thermia. And you know what? 50's a nicer, more round number anyway. <laughs> And with that final note, things finally seem to be settling down. The celestial tussle was finally over. <laughs> or was it? Because as mentioned earlier, across the galaxy, accounts vary. <gasps> <gasps> There are some who report that this stellar squabble isn't over at all. Sightings of fireflies pestering battle stars, kaiju punching megazords, and X-wings <laughs> drunkenly attempting to dogfight our wings still persist in small numbers. <laughs> Across the galaxy, what remained of the Galactic Empire had been investigating this mystery, but for a long time, they were unable to find any answers. Could it be because even though one host of this podcast decreed back in Smash Bash 2 that the Astro Kerfuffle was over, but another host then forgot this in a later episode and inserted that it was still going on? Could be. No, that can't be it at all. There had to be another explanation. <laughs> Time shenanigans. <gasps> <sighs> Course. Worst kind. The Empire traced the epicenter of the incongruity, which they had at this time dubbed the continuity hole, and they noticed something. <laughs> it was moving because it was a spaceship known as the Protector. That's called a reveal. Are you on the edge of your seat yet? <laughs> I mean, yes, but only because that's the best recording position, so I started that way. <laughs> you see, deep in the heart of the Protector was a mysterious experimental time travel device known as the Omega-13. Up until now, it had only been used to reverse time on rare occasions by increments of 13 seconds at a time, but the Thermians suspected that the powers within this device might be much greater. It wasn't long after the Empire made this discovery that the Protector's long-range sensors showed that a very large ship was approaching very fast. The Imperial Star Destroyer, known as the S Inigo Montoya had received orders to intercept the Protector and claim the Omega-13. Perhaps with this device, the Empire would be able to find a way to travel back in time and present... Oh, I have a blank here. I need another word for Astro Kerfuffle. I was going to fill it in later. <laughs> oh my god. I was like, oh, I, I'll, I'll look something what? up on no. thesaurus.com. Just leave it. This is so yeah. beautiful. I, I, right. don't, I think we're just leaving this in, buddy. The, the Empire <laughs> would be able to find a way to travel back in time to prevent their greatest defeat during the <laughs> and save the life of their greatest champion, who tragically died in an ill-advised pissing contest with Mewtwo. The Protector, its weapons still disabled from their last battle, was unable to resist being pulled in by the Star Destroyer's tractor beam and a platoon of 50 armed and armored stormtroopers boarded the ship. Their orders? 
Find and seize the Omega-13 and kill anyone who resisted. And if the Empire succeeds in their goal, the Astro Kerfuffle might start all over again, if it in fact has stopped to begin with. <laughs> As mentioned previously, <laughs> accounts vary. Right. <laughs> the Thermians, famous across the galaxy for being basically crap at everything, are certainly not going to be of any help in this matter. That leaves just the newly recruited redshirt security detail, who ready their phasers and watch as the airlock door begins to glow and spark. 50 stormtroopers on offense, 50 red shirts on defense. Who will win between the galaxy's most stoppable force and the universe's most movable object? I find my lack of knowledge on this matter disturbing, so I, Darth Clare, will be your judge this week. Advocating for the stormtroopers of Star Wars are Kit Mulcairin. Aren't you a little alive to be a red shirt? <laughs> <laughs> and Megan Bob. Ask not for whom the blaster rifle pews. It pews for thee. <laughs> <laughs> and advocating for the red shirts of Star Trek are Miles Schneiderman. Better red than dead, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan Mulcairin. They're dead, Jim. Dead certain to beat the stormtroopers. Boom! <laughs> oh, wow. We didn't even rehearse that. No. Nope. Uh, <laughs> strong stingers this week all around. You're yeah. already yeah. scoring points, which, which exist. <laughs> that I'm tracking. <laughs> <laughs> and to clarify, we are using red shirts as they appear in the original series of Star Trek and the stormtroopers as they appear in the rebellion era of Star Wars. So after the clone troopers, but before the First Order. In order to determine who goes first this week, I decided to go papal and brought together a conclave of cardinals to <laughs> cast their votes as to who would receive the honor and the burden of starting off the match. <laughs> that was the plan anyway. I ended up getting a room full of actual cardinals, you know, the little red birds. <laughs> and now it looks like they've caused a schism in the Catholic Church with two new popes, each one supporting one of the teams here today. But you know what? I really like Pope Tweedum's stance on gay marriage, and he's all about Team Red Shirts, so they'll be going first, followed by Team Stormtroopers. Team Red Shirts, set your arguments to opening. If the Stormtroopers of the Galactic Empire can be said to have a recurring, overriding tactic of some kind, it's this. Always attack with overwhelming advantages. They attack the Tantivy IV, a ship with a crew of 46, using a Star Destroyer, a ship with a complement of almost 10,000 Stormtroopers. They hit the Rebel base on Hoth with at least six AT-ATs and significantly superior numbers, while the best the Rebels can throw at them are repurposed Snowspeeders. Imagine if the US military invaded a camp of refugees, whose mightiest defenses were dog sleds, and you have a sense of how unfairly the Empire stacked the deck for this particular battle. But but sometimes even their usual tactic of playing dirty doesn't help. In the Battle of Endor, they start with a fortified base, tons of infantry, and multiple ATSTs, but still end up taken out by a squad of rebels small enough to fit on a single shuttle, and a group of teddy bears with sticks. By setting up this match as two groups of equal size, we have immediately given the stormtroopers an insurmountable handicap. The unsung heroes of the Starship Enterprise, on the other hand, while they may not be privileged enough to possess such things as recurring appearances, lines of dialogue that aren't just <laughs> hysterical screaming, or first and or last names, come into this match with their advantage thrusters set to maximum. For one thing, as opposed to the sci-fi shovelheads that are the Stormtroopers, every redshirt has been through Starfleet Academy and done well enough in both their education and their career to merit placement on a Constitution-class starship, one of only 12 in existence at the time. Additionally, in the original series, redshirts are, by definition, members of the Operations Division, which means they are either security personnel or engineers. The combination of those two facts means that everybody on our side of the battlefield are either highly trained combat monkeys, which the stormtroopers are not, or extremely intelligent scientists, which the stormtroopers are not. In other words, we have people who know how to use weapons combined with people who know how to construct and repair weapons. The stormtroopers have... cod pieces? <laughs> Ooh. The fan ridicule of Stormtrooper AIM got to such a degree that Lucasfilm itself explained, canonically, that stormtroopers were equipped with janky, unreliable, and inaccurate weaponry. I guess when your government loses quadrillions of credits investing in two short-lived war moons, the budget has to get cut somewhere else. <laughs> but even if stormtroopers use the best quality lasers that Star Wars had to offer, Star Trek's phasers are way, way more potent weapons. There's an episode of Next Generation where the Enterprise comes upon a hostile ship from a comparatively primitive alien race. They scan the ship and realize that their main weapons are lasers. The bridge crew has to visibly stifle their laughter. They react like people sitting in a tank who realize that their opponents are using slingshots. 
Stormtrooper weapons are literally a blast from the past, and they're not the only area in which the technology the Empire was using, quote, a long time ago, pales in comparison to that of the 23rd century. For example, the ability to acquire information is key in any battle, yet the Stormtroopers have no information gathering tech whatsoever, or at least nothing small enough and widely available enough to be carried personally by every member of a team. As far as I can tell, they don't even have their own communicators. Each of the red shirts has access to handheld tricorders, communicators, and universal translators, not to mention any other gadgets the Ingies can cook up from spare parts harvested from the nearest bulkhead. We have the power of Star Trek bullshit on our side. All you've got is one dude who gets a pat on the back for recognizing a droid component. That's cute. Stormtrooper battlefield tactics also leave a lot to be desired. Red shirts have to go through the incredibly rigorous Starfleet Academy in order to serve on a ship like the Enterprise, which puts them well above the level of training you would get at whatever crash course boot camp spits out stormtroopers by the metric ton. In fact, many red shirts started as Marines before they went to Starfleet Academy and would therefore have much of the same tactical training that stormtroopers have, but I guarantee you that no stormtrooper went through a highly prestigious military academy first before putting on that useless white plastic armor. And you can see so many examples of stormtroopers failing to use critical thinking or creativity in the field. Hell, they won't even investigate a locked door in A New Hope, even when actively looking for enemy fugitives. Door is locked, move on to the next one. Yeah, the red shirts can use their superior hacking and technobabble skills to bottleneck and redirect stormtrooper movements, but honestly, just being able to lock the door would do the trick. I know that on the surface, this appears to be a match of the terrible shots versus the easily killed. But don't get it twisted. Stormtroopers are just as fragile as red shirts are, and their armor is of no help whatsoever. Look at how many times the characters in Star Wars are able to take out a stormtrooper with a direct blaster bolt to the chest plate. In theory, that should be one of the thickest, most effective areas of armor on the body, but not once does it seem to stop or even slow down incoming fire. There's a reason Luke and Han ditch their stolen stormtrooper armor at the soonest possible opportunity in A New Hope. All it does is slow them down and reduce their peripheral vision. As underscored by Luke's line, I can't see a thing in this helmet. The idea of the red shirt has become part of the zeitgeist, and everyone basically knows that to be a Star Trek character who is not part of the main cast is to live in perpetual fear, as your inevitable demise has already been dictated by the narrative itself. Galaxy Quest gets a movie-length joke out of this idea, and John Scalzi got a Hugo Award out of it. Clearly, <laughs> the notion that red shirts equals dead shirts is popularly accepted. But this is Star Trek. We don't deal in anecdotal evidence here. We deal in science. So let's put aside popular opinion and look at the numbers. Over the course of the first three seasons of Star Trek, the Enterprise loses 56 of its 430 crew members. Total. 25 of those, less than half, are red shirts. We know from Stardates that those first three seasons cover pretty much the entirety of the Enterprise's original five-year mission under Kirk, so that means that over the course of five years, only 13% of the crew died, at an average of 11 crew members per year. Among red shirts, the Enterprise lost an average of five per year. And if you delve into what the sports world might refer to, and a shameless pun artist such as myself will definitely refer to as next-gen stats, you find that <laughs> of those 25 red shirts, 11 of them, nearly half, perished in just three highly extreme incidents. Take those three super bad days out of the equation, and you've got 14 red shirt deaths over the course of five years. And this is on a mission that is explicitly about contacting alien life, considering a population that consists of people in the operations division, otherwise known as security officers and engineers, otherwise known as the guys who go on away missions to alien planets. A casualty list with only 25 names on it under those circumstances isn't just explainable, it's downright impressive. Why do you think Starfleet eventually changed the color system so that the red shirts were actually the guys in command? Oh, and by the way, those 25 dead red shirts weren't exactly shot by nameless goons in dumb helmets. In fact, only one red shirt has ever died from being shot with an energy weapon. No, killing most of those red shirts took 
space witches, alien warlords, the hyper-acceleration of time itself, evil computers, evil androids, evil hyper-intelligent god machines, and a fucking glowing cloud. It is a little bit understandable for the red shirts to go down at the hands of the glow cloud guys. The glow cloud does not feel as we tiny humans feel. It has no need for thoughts or feelings of love. The glow cloud simply <laughs> is all, all hail, hail the mighty the glow cloud. Glow cloud. <laughs> all uh, oh no, hail. Oh, nice happened again. Before Miles starts mm. handing out his freshly minted religious pamphlets, there's one more point to explore here. There's a cracked article that's been passed around the internet quite a bit over the last few years that seeks to explain the frankly embarrassing hit rate of stormtroopers as a whole. Essentially, it comes down to human nature. People are really uncomfortable about killing each other, even in battlefield situations. And studies have shown that many soldiers will intentionally miss their targets in the hopes that someone else will shoot the target and let them sleep easy that night. But if that's true, then why are the rebels able to kill stormtroopers by the truckload with no apparent reluctance? Well, it turns out that the Empire has actually compounded their problem by making their soldiers wear identical dehumanizing helmets and armor. That's right, their armor, which does not protect against laser fire, only serves to completely remove any shred of humanity their enemies might have seen in them, ironically making them easier to kill. That's the stormtroopers in a nutshell. So obsessed with looking scary that they don't realize how much they've cut themselves down strategically. All they have, really, are their numbers. Take those away, and you're left with poorly armed, poorly armored, poorly trained recruits up against the finest Starfleet has to offer. That's no moon. It's the mountain of evidence we have of a red shirt win. All right. Very well done, Team Red Shirts. Team Stormtroopers, open the argument doors. Open the argument doors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kit Mulcairn, and I'm here to say I'm going to squash this myth about Stormtrooper incompetence in a major way. <laughs> First of all, A New Hope opens with rebel forces defending their ship from the boarding Stormtroopers, and it does not go well for the rebels because, spoiler alert, the Stormtroopers shoot them to death. Death by Pew Pew. <laughs> they also locate and successfully shoot a stun shot at Leia. Comparing Star Trek to Star Wars is comparing a bunch of space nerds to a bunch of space military personnel. Starfleet's main remit is deep space exploration, research, defense, peacekeeping, and diplomacy. And boy, does it show. The kinds of encounters that kill red shirts are by and large ordinary space wanderings or space meet and greets, not even trained military forces. Red shirts die from low-level opponents likely because they aren't expecting armed conflict. Apparently, they're not trained to expect it, so when something comes at them, they are wholly unprepared for it. Despite the nigh-impenetrable character shields that George Lucas placed on his main characters, we do have canonic evidence that stormtroopers are much better shots than we, the incredibly pedantic and judgmental Star Wars fan base, are led to believe. On Tatooine, the former general and wizened old space wizard, Obi-Wan Kenobi, comes across an effed up Jawa barge that got turned into metallic Swiss cheese by the stormtroopers. Luke assumes it was Tusken Raiders because he low-key racist like everyone else is toward the indigenous race of Tatooine. <laughs> but Obi's like, hold up, these blast points, too accurate for sand people. Only Imperial stormtroopers are so precise. Mm. And I can already hear Dan and Miles like, her, her, the Jawa barge is so big. <laughs> this wouldn't even be a contest if they couldn't hit at least that. <laughs> Show some fucking respect to Obi-Wan, hypothetical Dan and Miles. <laughs> the man survived Order 66. He knows the only way to do that much damage to a gigantic metal vehicle is through accurate shots at very precise points. Speaking of accuracy, not only are they actually good at mowing down rebels in narrow ship hallways, which is our scenario here today, they can also hit fast-moving targets like when they shot Leia off her speeder bike during the chase scene on Endor. Star Trek asked big questions about the nature of humanity. What is our purpose? What is our responsibility to the universe? It also asks other, smaller questions, like how does one die of being gently touched on the arm? <laughs> In the episode, That Which Survives, a red shirt is touched by a planetary defense system warning, not a person trying to kill him. After a gentle <laughs> shoulder touch, he clutches his stomach and then slowly collapses to the ground. No explanation is given. <laughs> R.I.P. Ensign Wyatt. 
<laughs> Four red shirts are killed by not taking cover when there is a space probe turned murderer on the loose. It vaporizes all of them instantly. More than that, they know it's dangerous. Nomad can shoot high-intensity energy bolts and takes blasts from photon torpedoes without issue. So their deaths are not the result of simple ignorance. They have zero self-preservation. So the stormtroopers will not trigger any of these standard-issue danger responses like hiding, thus increasing the number of casualties. R.I.P. Lieutenant Carlisle and three nameless red shirts. Now, on Mos Eisley, we see stormtroopers try to stop the Motley crew of space heroes from leaving. Han Solo is the only dude outside the ship, and I know I've gone up against Han twice in past matches, but he's a boss. I'm not even going front. Of course, an experienced rogue with more lives than a sack full of cats is going to evade the troopers. Meanwhile, red shirts, guys whose jobs involve security, engineering, and support services like communications, these dudes are investigating alien worlds without any sort of protective gear? No policies and procedures in place to ensure that people aren't being murdered by alien life every time they visit a new planet or vaporized over and over and over again? No space, OSHA? <laughs> you don't have enough red shirts to equal the badassery of Han Solo's left foot, so there is no comparison. Crewman Rayburn has his neck broken by an android that just walked up behind him and slowly <laughs> grabbed his face. You can actually see the moment where he loses the will to live. And it is surprisingly early in the process. <laughs> <laughs> Red shirts have the lowest awareness of their environment imaginable. Easily killed with slow and simple hand-to-hand -hand fighting. <laughs> Lieutenant Marple is killed by an alien ambling up beside him with a club raised before hitting him in the back of the head. Let us emphasize, this is red shirts in small potatoes encounters that don't even involve ranged weapons. They cannot handle themselves in regular life as space folk without dying. A stormtrooper could aim their rifle away from them, and the red shirt would probably still die from a particularly vigorous sneeze. <laughs> R.I.P. Rayburn. R.I.P. Marple. <laughs> okay, but what about when Luke and friends rescue Leia from the Death Star, dodging trooper fire left and right? Leia herself is like, hold up, that was too easy. They let our asses go so they could track us. Then Grand Moff Tarkin, in the next scene, confirms this was Vader's plan the whole time. If you want to talk some shit about how stormtroopers can't hit anything in the original trilogy, you gotta recognize that they were told by the scariest motherfucker around that he wanted those rebels alive. No disintegrations. Leia was right. She knew that her crew should not have been able to get away from the stormtroopers. Lieutenant Grant, while meeting up with some touchy Klingons, makes a sudden move, draws his phaser, and is then space frisbeed to death. <laughs> <laughs> on the one hand, drawing a phaser shows some self-preservation, but on the other hand, they were outnumbered and the best case scenario would be that they'd be taken prisoner. Given that at least six red shirts are killed during the run of the original Star Trek while wielding their weapons... I posit that the weapons are a kind of mating plumage or vestigial <laughs> organ and do not actually function in an offensive or defensive capacity. <laughs> R.I.P. Lieutenant Grant. <laughs> All right, quick game. Are these deaths from Star Trek or a Victorian novel? <laughs> Killed by Gorns. Aged to death. Horta ate them. A vapor. Turned into a mineral cube. Neck broken by a dandy. <laughs> Struck by lightning, thorns from a cruel flower. <laughs> <laughs> They're all from Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> really, the Gorn wasn't from Wuthering Heights? <laughs> There was that one Gorn seed, but it got cut. <laughs> also, these are possibly from Victorian novels, but definitely, definitely from Star Trek. R.I.P. Ensign O'Herlihy, Crewman Compton, Ensign Rizzo, Lieutenant Leslie, and two other guys, Crewman Thompson, <laughs> Crewman Watson, Lieutenant Kaplan, Crewman Herndorf. <laughs> Your Honor, this is a match between the too loyal to hit versus the too reckless to live. And if there's no superior officer to tell the troopers not to kill those crimson catastrophe nerds, by the end of this match, the floor of this starship will be covered in red. Now join me as I read a prayer from the Book of Smash Fiction to mourn those now lost to us through their own boneheadedness. We commit these many facts into the record as we commit these many, many fallen red shirts into the ground or space or mineral cubes, etc. <laughs> ashes to ashes, dust to dust, space to space, red shirts to dead shirts. In the sure and certain hope of a return to eternal nonsense through smash fiction, who shall change our arguings into podcastings that it may be preserved forever on the internet. Amen. 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 <laughs> ah.
I love the smell of lasers in the morning <laughs> or blasters or phasers or whatever you have. But I hope you guys still have some shots left because we are punching this up to warp factor rebuttals. <laughs> Team Red Shirts, energize. Wait, rebuttals already? Did I miss? I must have blacked out or something back there. <laughs> Does anyone else smell vanilla? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing I'd like to bring up is uh, you guys talked about Obi-Wan talking up the Stormtroopers' accuracy in A New Hope. Mm -hmm. And, like, the thing you have to remember, Obi-Wan has been on Tatooine since the end of the Clone Wars. Like, he goes there at the end of Episode 3. When he became a hermit, the Empire was still using clone troopers, which were all designed and trained to be really efficient soldiers. Like, they were designed to kill Jedi. That's what he was thinking of when he talked about their precision shooting. Like, by the time of A New Hope, the Stormtroopers were largely made up of recruits, which explains why they are such a grab bag of idiocy. And yet... And yet, they're real good at murdering, huh? Also, I mean, maybe. I mean, they take out Jawas and, they, and Moisture I mean, Farms. To be honest, Dan, we don't actually know if they took up Jawas. <laughs> no, no, we saw a dead Jawa. It's very well, yeah, but we didn't see any Stormtroopers killing right? them. It could have been anyone. <laughs> wow, you're so fucking racist to these Tatooine <laughs> people. Oh, shit. I just want to say, how dare you assume that Obi-Wan doesn't read the space news? <laughs> I do want to point out, you guys brought up the, the red shirts that were killed by Nomad and the fact that, like, they just kind of stood there while they shot him. I'm not going to defend all their actions here. I do want to say, though, I do want to say, though, that the red shirts shoot Nomad first. It has no effect. And then Nomad kills them. If that was a stormtrooper, they would have just won because stormtroopers go down when you shoot them. I mean, I guess that's possible, although, I, I mean, so they're going to shoot, take down one stormtrooper, and then all look just sort of like beautiful little deers in the headlights and go, oh, look, there's <laughs> I mean, somebody dead there. That's and then, speculative. Uh, did you see their faces? They got vaporized. Did you see their faces? Y yeah. Those were the oh, dearest boy. in the headlight. I've never seen <laughs> something so fawn-like. We, I mean, we see in the opening scene when stormtroopers are fighting the rebels and your red shirts are no rebels, that stormtroopers are capable of, you know, using cover. You talk about stormtroopers using cover, which is fine if you're dodging blaster bolts. It's a little less effective when you're going up against phasers because, like, the handheld phasers that the red shirts use can vaporize 650 cubic meters of rock per shot. That's like half a block's worth of stormtroopers turn to dust every time they pull the trigger, whether they're in cover or not. I mean, that tactic will only get them killed. But they never use them, though. They just hold <laughs> yes, them. Yes, they do. They use yeah. them all the time. I, but I, and yet they, they get snuck up on and murdered <laughs> so, by people who okay. shamble up to so the club. I, I, I want to make this point. I want to make this point. You are right that they get taken out in melee combat quite frequently. Okay? <laughs> They're not big, strong, buff men. This is ranged combat, though. And in ranged combat, they do considerably better because their guns work and yours don't. And there's no evidence to suggest that red shirts get shot very often. They really don't. When the guy got taken out by the Gorn, it's like he didn't even know there were other yeah. things around him. That is the one example of a red shirt being shot. There is only one. I mean, doesn't a frisbee count as ranged combat? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's like 10 feet away at best. I mean, that's worse, right? Because a blaster pistol can shoot way farther than that. And they have a ton of ammo. They shoot a lot. Apparently, the blaster can shoot very far without going off to the left or right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Team Stormtroopers. Look, sir. Rebuttals. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. If they're still murdering rebels with these janky weapons, isn't that just a point in our favor? I mean, Leia and Han and Luke grab stormtrooper weapons and use them way better than the stormtroopers do. So obviously it's a fault of their training. Oh, way better. You mean like when the stormtroopers were told not to murder them? You want to know how many times someone misses with a phaser in Star Trek? Wasn't it's essentially never. Those it's things auto-target. They don't use them. They use them all the time. W wasn't, uh, <laughs> wasn't the no disintegration line Vader talking to Boba Fett? Yes, it was. I was still just trying to make okay, a just making you know, sure. Star Wars reference. Just, just, I want, just want that Notice on the record. Yeah, I don't. Notice integrations. Thank you for recognizing my Star Wars quote. <laughs> <laughs> We're all very proud of you, Kit. Yeah, I can be a Star Wars fan. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a point so much as just a burn. Starfleet Academy, clearly a party school, if those are what the red shirts are like. 
very low entrance requirements from what I've heard. Dude, if you read all the fucking, like, you know, not to use a Star Wars term, but, like, the extended universe. Oh, God. Like, Starfleet Academy is no fucking joke. There's an entire series of books that devoted to, like, the next-gen characters and shit going through Starfleet and the original series characters going through Starfleet. It's pretty fucking rigorous. Also, I mean, if we take scenes that honestly should have been cut out of Star Wars but weren't, that demonstrates that the Stormtrooper Academy does not teach its recruits to not walk headfirst into a door before it's finished rising. So, okay, look, they're just trying to be inclusive <laughs> of people who maybe can't tell the height of things. Maybe because so well. their helmets like completely restrict their peripheral vision. <laughs> and yet, murder. Look, I don't give a shit about your percentages. When you got fools getting murdered by space flowers because the Enterprise's <laughs> idea of armor is comfy looking Fruit of the Loom shirts. So, so yeah. don't talk shit about our armor when you're wearing cloth. The, 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 that's fair. The space flower in question, though. <laughs> I just want to say the space flower in question is part of one of those four massive events. They land on a planet that looks really beautiful and everything is nice because it's intentionally drawing them in. And it turns out to be an ancient <laughs> evil AI trying to kill them. How... You know what? I don't want to get into the how they could be so dumb as to go like, it's beautiful. It must be <sighs> safe. Like, these two things are obviously <sighs> synonymous. Look, stormtroopers don't have the tactical wit to pretend to be flowers and shoot darts. Like, <laughs> okay. they're just going to come at you as soldiers, and that's not going to work against the red shirts. Then, Lots of other things work, but not that. Then I would like to make a point about the communicators and tricorders. They do have them, but they also just go off on their own into dark caves and, like... <laughs> unsafe <laughs> groves and you know hidden valleys and then end up dying by random things they're like children they just wander off on their own and die this is not taking place in a cave or a grove this is on a starship the this is not a scenario in which they're going to an alien planet to explore it going in with the starfleet mentality of assuming everything is not hostile until it shows itself to be hostile which allows things to sneak up on them they are repelling a hostile force in a starship environment it doesn't change the fact that these are like basically scientists just going up against feared military yeah, feared fe because they've killed so many feared people. Feared by dumb people. The thing you have to remember, though, is that these are Star Trek scientists. And the way you solve problems in Star Trek is with Technobabble. Is like, when the engineers can get into the systems of the ship, they can erect force fields within the ship. They can depressurize certain rooms. They can, like, close blast doors around stormtroopers. They can just, like, lock them in a storage room. The fact that they have these engineering skills is going to make them significantly more dangerous than any stormtrooper is. I don't think they're going to lock the door. You made that point about the Stormtroopers. <laughs> it's a show of 60s era bumbliness. They're not going to lock the door. That's just not going to happen. People didn't do that in the 60s, guys. I mean, <laughs> I left their doors unlocked, right? Lock the <laughs> door, erect a force field around the room, tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> The battle has been raging on for what feels like an eternity. Many red shirts have fallen, many stormtroopers have fallen, but the fighting continues. At this point, only one thing is certain. Every single one of these shooty space boys are going to fight each other to their last breath. Captain Jen Ben realizes that there's only one way to prevent further violence, and possibly, if they're lucky, undo the violence that has already been done. She's going to activate... The lightning round! No! Oh no! In space? Set lightning round action. to maximum. Oh, sorry, I read that wrong. Uh, she's going to activate the Omega-13. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just misread yeah. my notes. And you know, normally it can only go back in time like 13 seconds, but she doesn't think that's going to be enough time to fix all this, so she starts fiddling with the settings. She sees a little knob that can be adjusted, and she thinks it might be what controls how far forward or backward in time oh the God, device jumps the when you activate first. it. You know, it's a weird alien language. She's not really sure no, what, the, yeah. what the units are listed. Sure, sure. Uh, she's not quite sure if she's adjusting it to be forwards or backwards, but you know, it looks like right now it's set to 1. She's gonna try three. That's like two more notches. That that seems fine. What could be the harm in that? <laughs> so uh, after adjusting the knob, she fires up the Omega 13. When the blinding light clears, all the stormtroopers and the red shirts have indeed found themselves returned to life, but they are no longer on the protector. Instead, they're standing on an Earth-like planet on a street corner of a city. The protector and the time travel device inside of it have both vanished. But where have they gone? Well, that's a question for another day, and perhaps another episode, if the other hosts of this podcast remember to keep track of the continuity between matches, which, of course, they always do. <laughs> no, definitely of not. Course. Definitely not. But for now, our heroes have another question to answer. Where are they, and when are they? 
Hmm. Women wearing hoop earrings and jean shorts, Mm. men wearing t-shirts over long sleeve shirts. People are sending each other text messages, but very slowly on Nokia N gauges. (laughs) And a song is playing on the radio. It's The Reason by Hoobastank. Of course, it's 2004. Oh, no. The stench of corn nuts hanging heavy in the air. (laughs) (laughs) The taste of the aughts. It's 2004. The aughts. Captain Genben and the rest of the Thermians settle down and get jobs common to this time period, like working for peer-to-peer file sharing programs and selling secondhand Livestrong bracelets. (laughs) (laughs) The Red Shirts and the Stormtroopers part ways, but swear vengeance against each other. You see, there was one thing that both of them had trouble with during the battle on the Protector. Accuracy. They can't hit each other, and they can't avoid being hit either. If only there was some activity that they could take up that would help them improve these skills, both sides think. And then one day, when both sides are simultaneously watching ESPN 8, The Ocho, it hits them. (laughs) Dodgeball. Yeah. Advocates. In an effort to both get better at hitting things and get better at dodging things, your respective sides have each started a professional dodgeball team in the style of the 2004 sports comedy film Dodgeball. So, what is your team name, outfit, and logo? What is the training regimen that your team does in order to prepare for the big match against the other side? What real-world sponsor are you able to secure, and what sort of promotion or advertisement do you do with them? And finally, when the final showdown of Red Shirts vs. Stormtroopers occurs on the court of the Dodgeball World Championship in Las Vegas, what surprising strategies does your team employ to ensure victory? Team Red Shirts went first in the main round, so Team Stormtroopers will go first in the lightning round. Team Stormtroopers, remember the five Ds of the lightning round. Debate, dawdle, digress, dab, and, uh, <laughs> well, I've, I've taken a vow I, I can never say this word, the fifth D of the lightning round. Um, <laughs> My- Miles might say it, Liz might say it, but uh, I certainly never would. Jim! There we are. Oh, man, he'd been holding that in a while. Uh, yeah, too long. there was some fire behind that one. <laughs> How often do you think you get your dog to, like, jump <laughs> when you scream that? He's used to it by now. <laughs> uh, so... For the name, there was a a little bit of a back and forth amongst the stormtroopers about this, but they did finally settle on the death balls. (laughs) Uh, Some were really, really pushing for the storm boopers. Mm. (laughs) Uh, And as for the outfit, I mean, obviously black and white athletic gear. They need a mask, so they went with hockey masks. So they're going to have way better facial protection. I don't know if that's allowed in dodgeball, but you know what? Whatever. Also, thermal bombs strapped to the back of the belt. Because it's issue. Mm-hmm. Can't take that away from them. They are still going to have their cod pieces. They're not going to not have the cod pieces. But these are <laughs> 2000s cod pieces. These are chrome. Because how cool. So pimp. It looks like rims, but like for your dick and balls. <laughs> Does it have underlighting? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, we're going to do that. It's got track lighting. No, that's a different thing. Never mind. That's for your kitchen. <laughs> Spinning rims. Yeah. On your cod piece. The logo is the Dodge Star. It is a dodgeball, but obviously it's a dodgeball as a Death Star. The glorious Dodge Star. (laughs) Our logo shall be known across the land. You know, a picture of a dodgeball that looks like the Death Star is basically indistinguishable from a picture of the Death Star. (laughs) (laughs) That is the beauty of it. There is very little Photoshop involved. And much like the Death Star can destroy, you know, a planet. So the Dodge Star... (laughs) can't come and destroy your face or if you get hit in the belly destroy your tummy (laughs) that's no dodgeball (laughs) so they prepare they live together every second they sleep in one giant pile like puppies they eat out of a trough they wrestle with one another and then they hire some droid kato's that jump out at them at random times and try to pelt them with dodgeballs And then as a group, like as a field trip, they all hold hands. They all go to the optometrist and get special dodge goggles so they can finally fucking see. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. They're way better equipped than they used to be. So there, no more of that nonsense. Sponsorship. Oh, the sponsorship. So as of 2003, (laughs) Kit, Kit, remind me, what was, what was happening in 2003? Um, well, I mean, I guess, I guess, uh. A lack of horniness, because Cialis was invented, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it was Cialis. 
two stormtroopers in separate bathtubs. Oh my god! Wearing their standard issue masks, like full armor, just in the bathtubs. <laughs> and there is water in that bathtub. You know, there's the soft, sexy music that plays, and they're holding hands. And then, in like swirling text underneath, it says, huh? "Cialis, it'll get you horny for you know whatever, like dodgeball." <laughs> wow. And finally, special strategies. Well, I mean, obviously, they're going to reflect light off of their cod pieces. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, I'd be a naturally. fool. Fool not to. Yeah. I mean, if you're not getting blinded by it, you're certainly getting distracted by it. Maybe so. they'll have better time doing precision aiming with their crotch than with uh, their eyes <laughs> in their hands. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Probably. I haven't played dodgeball in a while. I suppose if the red shirts are suitably distracted, some of the, uh, the storm boopers <laughs> or the death balls could sneak to the side, you know, just sneak up and... and Lightly bop a ball on the back of a red shirt's head, and oh no, <gasps> the sport's first murder. <laughs> it fell so easily. <laughs> Who could have seen this? <laughs> All right, we did it. Good job. <laughs> very good job, Team Stormtroopers. Team Red Shirts, we know you can't dodge a very slow melee attack, but can you dodge a ball? Uh, so, our team name is the Kobayashi Marus. Aww. Because going up against us is a lost cause. That's Aww. right. <laughs> That's great. That's right, we wear uh, red jumpsuits to hide the blood of our enemies. <laughs> or something, I yep. don't know. Which uh, actually ends up inspiring the rock band, the Red Jumpsuit Apparatus. Oh, um, oh shit. Now, this band was <laughs> Time shenanigans! Formed, yeah. Yes, this band was formed in 2003, but I'm gonna say time shenanigans and possibly before this they went by the name the Rolling Stones 2 and then they decided to change it after they saw this dodgeball match <laughs> Claire just so you know the phrase time shenanigans was written down in this doc by your brother so I am now officially convinced you're related <laughs> yep that's correct um, the logo for the Kobayashi Marus by the way is a man half dissolved due to transporter malfunction <laughs> oh oh so sad oh, oh god uh Mainly for training, they find, like, a, a local 2004, like, computer store and they start performing simulations. But uh, they're also going to do some engineering work, I think, Dan, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, they have a lot on their plate in the lead up to this match, which is actually good because they can do that Star Trek slingshot time travel technique to make yeah. sure that they can squeeze in those crucial extra months of training and building and engineering. That technology and uh, all their their training needs are... Uh, are bought with money from their sponsor, Verizon. Verizon commercials featuring uh, the crew still getting signal on the Enterprise. Who would have thought it? Yeah. Um, they use a uh, Nokia N-Gage, you know, because N-Gage. Yeah. It's, oh. it's hilarious. It's, yeah. It is. Everyone loves it. Everyone's quoting that ad. Uh, but also they bring in some extra money by setting up an online matchmaking site called Stardate. When it actually comes down to the match, uh, all of their engineering that they've been doing finally gets to see the light of day because their tech still works even in the past. So what they start doing is they uh, alter the wave frequency of the dodgeball so that uh, it occurs in multiple locations at the same time. Uh, They set up a one-way force field between the two sides of the court so that they can get clean shots, but anything that the stormtroopers throw just bounces right back at them. Yeah, you know, they uh, they build a drone and they hide it in one of the balls so they can make it do whatever they want by remote control. They uh, they set up holographic versions of themselves and wait for them to get eliminated. That's like how the match starts. And then when the stormtroopers think they've won and start celebrating, then we strike. Because let me tell you yeah, something. Right. This is like some fucking revenge of the nerd shit, but less problematic. And <laughs> because this is, you know, this is all the fucking science geeks fucking beating the shit out of some fucking stormtrooper Nazi dodgeball players with their brains. <laughs> All right. Well, I got a lot of stuff here. Facts? Question mark? (laughs) (laughs) I got to sort through all this. I forgot to write a funny thing for this part. So time shenanigans, astro kerfuffle, all that. All those classic bits. Bye. I'm going to go think about things. Okay. Have fun. All right. Bye. Yeah. Bye. It's interesting doing this match and coming to this judges segment because Star Wars and Star Trek, I feel like, are things we have talked about extensively on this show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. We could talk about Galaxy Quest. That's great. Oh, we should talk about Galaxy mm, we Quest. We could talk all about day, Galaxy every Quest every day. <laughs> Bob, how much Galaxy Quest have you seen versus how much Star Trek you've seen? Um, well, there's only the movie, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, on a proportionate level, like, uh, I assume she's seen 100% of Galaxy Quest. Oh, oh. Then let me say I have seen. Some of the original, 
and then some of the one with Picard, whichever one that is, and uh-huh. some of the one the with one. Janeway, and that is all. I was interested by how much you were really attaching yourself to these uh, red shirts and giving them these loving obituaries during your opening <laughs> arguments. Like, I don't know why I didn't see that one coming, but it is a very Bob thing to do with I, this match. I mean, they, to me, they felt like sarcastic obituaries. Well, for but. sure. But also, I do feel like with Bob, there's a genuine undercurrent of sincerity. Always, there. I, always. Yeah, I'm. it's very hard for me to be insincere, but I... <sighs> It's just a weird concept for a show from the 60s where the values of it seem to be, oh, let's not have it be super violent. Let's solve problems through thinking, like working together and all that other stuff. But then also to have all these deaths that don't mean anything. Or well, that- they're basically to raise the stakes, right? I, I get that, but it is just a weird inability to see how these things are part of the same problem, I guess. I mean, so I was like kind of not kidding in my opening about debunking this whole red shirt thing. There are 79 episodes in the original series. A red shirt dies in 13 of them. Yep. And only in 22 of them does anyone die, period. Yeah, and it makes me think, are the only the really famous episodes then are the ones where people die? I think it's just a thing that kind of caught on as part of the lore of the show. Because the episodes where red shirts die are like, are not the best episodes of Star Trek. Do you think it's because in video they've lived on as these horrible, poorly acted stage deaths? And yeah, so that's probably. where it's coming from. Because, like, as gifts, they're fantastic. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> yeah. It seems like the, the myth sort of started somewhere and started the snowball, which is weird because I'm pretty sure that um, when they made Next Gen, like, it must have been an older thing because I think when they started Next Gen, they made the captain and commander's outfits red, like, in a direct response to that. Do you not think it's because Picard looks better in red than he would in gold? You know man, what? That, that man, man would look, look sexy in, in whatever color. color you want to put him yeah. in. Thank you, Dad. I think gold would make him look <laughs> washed out. What about puce? I don't I know. Mean, yeah. In the later movies, he's in those, like, slick, like, black and blue costumes. He looks damn good in those, so. Well, yeah, he's a winter. He's not a spring, you know? I'm curious, Kit and Bob, did you ever think about trying to, like, logic your way into using stuff from Rogue One? Mm, Are you kidding? I mean, I don't know. I guess it seemed a little, like, unfair. I was happy with what I was finding, because kind of like you, Miles, I was finding that, oh, wait, this, like, idea that stormtroopers are really bad shots is kind of an overblown thing. Yeah. I feel like the troopers are just a little bit like better represented in Rogue One than they are in the original trilogy. Yeah, they're actually like a genuine threat in Rogue One, but that's because they have a lot of disposable characters as their protagonists in that yeah, movie. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like the directing was maybe in the writing is better a little bit and just <laughs> You don't fucking have to convince far. me. I am on the record of the opinion that the new Star Wars movies are better than the original trilogy. So Oh yeah. Uh, well, uh, the original trilogy is so fun, but, like, the more Lucas touched stuff, the more he got it Dude, all Lucasy. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's a fine original it's really, trilogy. It's really fine. I'm, I'm here, it's by the perfectly way. perfectly adequate. Hey, it's a Claire. serviceable fine. trilogy. Yes, indeed. It's just not great, like fucking Last Jedi was. Hi, Claire. Hi, how's it going, guys? Pretty good. How was great. How, how are you being doing? away? I'm conflicted. I'm very conflicted. <laughs> this has been very fun. There's been a lot of dumb stuff. Most of Yay. the notes that I've taken say things like, phasers don't miss. It doesn't matter. They don't use them. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, or, uh, I mean, they do. <laughs> the red shirts didn't do anything to Nomad. No, they shot him, but he was immune. And then they killed him. But the red shirts didn't move, though. There are ways to interpret both of these characters as competent and both of these (laughs) characters as incompetent. The red shirts could either be the highly trained militaristic dudes who are also all all engineers and who have these weapons that just like melt through anything and they always use them and shoot people and they're just like super efficient and they die very infrequently, you know, and it's all a myth that they die all the time. Or we could go to the other side. Stormtroopers get a bad rap. They're super great. They're always letting people escape. You know, that hallway fight scene, they're just mowing people down and they're unstoppable most of the time. So the question is like, which one of these is actually supported by the text and which one of these is wild speculation that's deviating from <laughs> canon? Um, based it's nice on, like, that you think that at least one of them yeah. is supported by text. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, char- charitable. <laughs> I'm really genuinely persuaded by the Stormtrooper thing about they can't see in the helmets. Like, that's a thing that Luke says. That's not weird speculation. But that hallway fight scene, they seem really good at fucking shooting those rebels, you know? Um, And 
I'm so won over on such a deep level by Bob's assertion that the red shirts are always just like deers in the headlights who are just <laughs> willing and relieved whenever death greets them. And they're just <laughs> <laughs> very, very slow to resist any sort of threat coming to them and like moving like they're underwater all the time. Like, And at the end of the day, when I'm picturing the fight scene happening, that's kind of more what I'm seeing, honestly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, red shirts. But like, wow. I picture the stormtroopers like the opening fight scene, shoot a bunch of people and the red shirts like very slowly moving to do things and getting shot. Like, <laughs> I just want you guys to know that if I still cared about this stupid fucking podcast, I'd be pissed right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yay. But fortunately, I don't. Our stupid people. <laughs> Yay. I, this is very tough for me. I, I could have oh, gone either way. Like yeah. there's, I really won over by both of the visions you guys are putting through, but I felt like the deer in the headlights thing was not sufficiently refuted. Well, guys, if I had to lose to some dumpuses, <laughs> I'm glad it was you representing them. You did a very Aww. good job, and you should be very pleased this with yourselves. This was a, a very fun Dumpus fight. Dumpuses in space! Yeah, oh, yeah. so many Dumpuses. Time for the space thanks. Uh, first of all, on Patreon, we just got a little uh, message from patron Chris McDougall. Ooh. He says, this is the only place on the internet I trust. And uh, he says That's that because he got hooked on Steven Universe thanks to this pod. Wow. And uh, was actually wondering if we had any recommendations for Steven Universe podcasts. Claire, do you know? Oh, Miles, yeah. Do you um, know? There's an official Steven Universe podcast. I think, is it just the official Steven Universe podcast? It has another name or? Uh, there is one called Gem Talk um, that I listen to. Right. Uh, um, I think the official one is just called like the Steven Universe podcast. I think that's just the name of it. I have not heard Gem Talk, I don't think. Oh, yes. The, you're, you're right. There is the Steven Steven Universe podcast, which is the one put out by Cartoon Network. Uh, then there is Gem Talk. Um, oh, wow. Also, you can, uh, if you go back in time a little bit, you can listen to Elle Collins talking about it on Into It, I think. Yeah, uh, they had a recurring segment called Crystal Clods. It was like a sub show on the feed that yeah. was all about Steven Universe. There weren't a ton of episodes of it, but what they had was very good. Yeah, very um, good stuff. Yeah. If you want to listen to them, like delve into, I think, season four. Then no, that's, yeah. that's good shit. The official podcast is also really good. Any of the episodes that Rebecca Sugar is on are great. She's yeah. so great to hear. They also recently had Estelle on as a guest, yeah. which was great. Oh, yeah. wow. the, the official podcast is basically all about like interviewing people involved with the show and asking them about it. Whereas mm-hmm. Gem Talk is more of a, of a like episode by episode review show. And Crystal Clots is going deep on all like the fan speculation yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it's really good too, but yeah. There you go, Chris. You got a few things to listen to. If anybody else has recommendations, Chris posted this question on our Patreon in the post section. So you can reply to him directly. Let me know, too. I want to know about new Steven Universe podcasts, too. I I sort of (laughs) avoid them sometimes because I'm afraid. I I have very strong feelings about Steven Universe. I'm very protective of it. And I I don't want to hear a bunch of dumb people talk about it, saying dumb (laughs) things. I'm like, no, you're wrong. (laughs) But tell me about your Steven Universe podcasts if you find good ones. Chris, I hope you'll join the fan faction someday. Oh, yeah, that's the that's the best place to go to just talk directly to the fans. He also would like more Australian accents. So. Oh, boy. Because <laughs> he's Australian. Can we ensure that Liz never listens to this episode? Uh, can we make sure uh, that I doesn't think happen? By virtue of the fact the episode exists, we can ensure that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It is about space, so she is more mm, likely. That's her domain. That's true. Over to Twitter. Thank you to JD Ketch, Sid Rabbit, Bender Turner, Cosplay Fiend, Cosplay Devotee. Jake Wars for a fake Jake. Wow, you nailed the timing on that one, Jake. Yeah. Decade fan, Dangle, Mike Carbuccia, Robert Ramsey, and Matias Tatimez. And on Facebook, thank you to David Waters, Jeff Polier, Adam Mayo, Matias Tatimez, and Daniel Kidder. We also wanted to thank Jen Ben, a patron of yeah. ours who became the new captain of the Protector. Sorry, Mathazar. I think that was his name from Galaxy Quest, right? Although yeah. now she's selling yeah. Livestrong bracelets, so. Oh, that's right. Well, you know, (laughs) life takes some uh, unexpected turns and twists when you're a patron on Smash Fiction, but you can always be guaranteed of some great bonus content. Another thing that you can do on the Smash Fiction Patreon is if you are a $5 patron or higher, you get to vote not only on bonus content, but on the occasional match that we do. This particular match was voted on by our patrons, and it was originally suggested to us by a longtime fan, Thomas Durfee who suggested this to us uh, quite some time ago and keeps coming up in our rotation. And it was uh, our patrons who actually made it happen. So thanks to Jen Ben. Thanks to Thomas Durfee. Thanks to all our patrons. Thanks to our listeners. And thanks also to Brian Richard Curtis Russell, the person who left us our newest iTunes review. Ooh, Ooh, exciting. 
he gives us five stars, says this is a fun podcast to listen to. He really enjoys all of the different shows that we do, the matches and league and all the different Smash Metafictions and stuff. He does have a couple of requests for us in terms of league. Ooh. First of all, he's wondering if we're ever going to see a scene of Stitch being skeletal because uh, he has the mm -hmm. cursed coin of Cortez. Oh, from that's a Pirates good point. Yes. Uh, what I will say is uh, you only show up as a skeleton when you're holding one of those coins if you stand in direct moonlight. Yeah. Which and I don't believe that has happened to Stitch I yet. I don't believe it has, and I've been waiting. He also points out the fact that Stitch is currently immune to drowning. Good to know. Because he's holding the coin. He also just says skeletal T-Rex amount. So Just saying. I think his point is valid. I, I could Skeletal give the coin. T-Rex mount. I, I could give the coin to Wax. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have time to do a listener question if, uh, Claire, you would like to pick one out. Okay, so we have a question here from Sal Ponce. This is a real hard-hitting question. I don't know if we can handle it, but uh, tacos or burritos, question mark. Assuming burritos, colon. For breakfast burritos, do you prefer bacon, sausage, chorizo, something else? <laughs> For other meals, frijoles, black beans, no beans, chili beans, some other bean, what kind of cheese? I'll take this one first. Um, burritos is clearly the right answer. Breakfast burritos is also clearly the right answer. Bacon is the right kind of breakfast burrito, though chorizo will do in a pinch. The other part of the question was what kind of beans? Black beans is the right answer for that. Uh, refried beans will also do fine. Any other kind, avoid. And as far as cheese, uh, you know, there's lots of options. Cheese is good. In a burrito, I would say pepper jack, cheddar, or mustard. Wow, that, that was... Very thorough, Miles. I feel like I can't really follow that up with anything. I'm that was sort of a good. breakfast burrito connoisseur. I don't know if you breakfast, knew this, but... Uh, breakfast burritos are so good. I burrito, made, of all yeah. the things I miss, I miss those the most. I can largely support what you're saying, but the only context in which I will disagree is if you go to Chipotle, get the kids meal. I'm serious. It is like $4 and you get... Two tacos, chips, and a drink. And if you try to order this like other ways, it's like $10 plus dollars. Get the kids meal at That's Chipotle. So it's what so good. Fuck? Speaking of Chipotle, I'm a bad Latina. That's my favorite burrito. Like, <gasps> I'm sorry. Wow. I like that white, that white shit. Wow, you like that <laughs> McDonald's Mexican food, huh? <laughs> no, just Chipotle. They do it good. They're um, owned by McDonald's. And what kind of cheese? What kind of cheese? All the cheese. That's the answer. Because yeah. I'm lactose intolerant and I'm cheating death. <laughs> All I will say is if you have the option to smother your breakfast burrito in green chili, do that. Of course. Yeah, you should oh, definitely yeah. do that. Options are secondary. New Mexico uh, style. Yeah. Green salsa or green hot sauce is a must. Like if you have to have red, you have to have green too. You have to Christmas that shit. You can't just have oh, red. Yeah, because I red by itself is only okay if it's like carne like that's the yeah. only circumstance under which red by itself is acceptable in all other situations green is preferred all right well we have to end this call because i'm getting very hungry well so. there's <laughs> th hold on hold on there's something very important sal has a second part to his question it okay. is also what is your favorite flavor of corn nuts <gasps> ranch Ew. oh can i just get the powder ranch <laughs> powder ranch. yes they sell ranch nuts powder in my mouth. i mean you you can't lose when you crunch into the Delicious flavors and oh, wow. unbeatable texture of America's finest oh, snack. Uh, probably Don't... barbecue or ranch, though, would be yeah. my, my answer. Uh. They're like my children. <laughs> all of my children. <laughs> and I am Kronos, for I will devour all of them. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fantastic way to go out. Thank you very much for listening to this week's episode of Smash Fiction. Next week, we have our... 37th. 37th? <laughs> we can just leave that <laughs> in. Well, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> episode of our podcast Extraordinary League and the week after that the match will be Storm versus Raiden versus Sailor Jupiter versus Pikachu Smash Fiction is produced by Miles Schneiderman and production assistant Sharon Schneiderman with logo design by Claire Mulcairin. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod of the Clan McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Hitman. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. 
Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going, and we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. And to clarify, we're using the red shorts, red shorts. The- <laughs>